Food is a basic need for all animals, but what sets us apart as a species, or as a historical sequence of species even, is our reliance on tools, on material culture, in order to prepare food, catch food, trap food, serve food, interact with food in many different kinds of ways. And this is true whether we're talking about modern human beings or ancestral species like Australopithecines, Homo erectus, and, and so forth. One of the things that sets archaeology apart as a discipline is our focus on very, very long timelines um, and our insistence that it's important to understand the deep histories of these kinds of processes where a historian of food might look back a century or a few hundred years, archeologists look back tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, even millions of years in thinking about how our ancestors interacted with their environments, with animals, with plants, with each other, um, and in particular in producing food. Now, I don't like to get too hung up on specific dates, um, even identification of species. This is an area where the, the research is constantly developing and changing. Uh, we learn more almost every day uh, about the ancient past. But there's a sort of a basic framework that I can give you that as much as we might quibble over details or we might want to change it tomorrow, certainly within the next year or so. Some of the details as we understand them will have changed. Um, the basic framework gives us a, a starting point in order to understand these kinds of processes. The earliest phase of archaeological materials that we recognize is what's called the Paleolithic, the Old Stone Age. Um, and in turn, it's followed by the Mesolithic, the Middle Stone Age, and the Neolithic, the New Stone Age. Um, but let's start with the Paleolithic. The Paleolithic is also subdivided into three parts, the Lower, Middle, and Upper Paleolithic. And these are technologically distinct and to some extent distinct in the species that, we, that we're talking about in association with the technologies uh, of these periods. The earliest form of recognizable tools that we have, um, and as usual, there's the caveat with archeological materials that we can really only talk about things that preserve. So it's entirely possible that things made out of softer materials, wood and, and plant materials and so forth, uh, bone even, might not have survived and they might have been there and we just don't know them because they're not preserved. Um, so what, we, what we're talking about almost universally with these earliest phases is stone tools. And the earliest one of these is what we call the Oldowan chopper. Production and use of the Oldowan chopper goes back in East Africa at least over three million years. And the technology continues in use up until oh, about a million and a half years ago, maybe even a little bit more recently in some parts of the world. The identified species associated with the Oldowan technology include Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and most likely uh, Australopithecines as well. The Oldowan chopper, when you look at it, even when you handle it, it's basically a rock. But it's a rock that's been treated in a particular way. It's had a number of flakes knocked off. In this case, about six flakes have been knocked off. And in this case, they've been knocked off in two directions. Uh, some old wand choppers do only have flakes knocked off on, in, in, in one way. What this does is it allows the concentration of force, and not only from the movement of your arm, but also from the weight of the rock itself, to be concentrated along this edge in order to produce a more controlled and more powerful blow. We're reasonably confident that a large part, at least, of what these, these choppers were being used for was breaking open bones. Um, and particularly breaking open long bones like femurs and crania, skulls, in order to get at the lumps of fat that are inside both of those kinds of bones. In a femur, of course, you have marrow, bone marrow, um, and in the cranium you have the brain. Our ancestors likely were not particularly suited to compete effectively as primary hunters, um, particularly against large game species. 
Um, and even as scavengers, they would have had to compete with many other more ferocious kinds of animals, including not only scavenging mammals like hyenas and jackals, but scavenging carrion-eating birds as well, which can be quite ferocious. One might think through the scenario. Some predator species makes a kill uh, of, a, of an animal. And being a powerful predatory species, they eat pretty much whatever they want. They get to eat the prime cuts uh, from the carcass. And once they've had what they want, they kind of wander along. And then the scavengers start moving in. And the biggest, most ferocious scavengers are going to be the first to come in uh, and, and get their pick of the next things that are available on the carcass. Um, and so the tastier bits of meat, uh, the tongue, the eyeballs, uh, some of the internal organs will, will start to go. And as each successive order of scavenger goes through, what is left behind on the carcass becomes less and less. And so the, more, the higher you can move up in that sequence, the more options you have for, for food sources. Now, some predators and scavengers have jaws that are large and powerful enough to crush some bones in order to get at the marrow, the brain that, that may be inside. Um, if you have a, a dog, you may well have given it a marrow bone at some point to chew on, and you've seen how it can gnaw on the bone and break it open and to, to, to get to the yummy marrow that's inside. But if the bone is large enough, then the jaw can't open wide enough to get around it uh, in order to apply the pressure to crush the bone. And so if you can come up with a technology that enables you to get into those bones that are too large to crush with a jaw, it gives you an edge. And that's exactly what our ancestors did with the Oldowan chopper. Now, another thing that producing Oldowan choppers does in order to break stones to produce a flaked, sharp edge, as with these choppers, you have to first know what kind of stone to use. You have to know where to apply the force, how hard to apply the force, at what angle to apply the force. Um, this is what I like to think of as the beginnings of material science. It's a lot earlier than most people working today as material scientists tend to think, but it's really where that process of thinking about the world as materials, as things that can be manipulated and processed and turned into other things, it's, it's, it's where it begins. So producing these kinds of tools starts with a knowledge base. It also, because of those kinds of mechanical processes, it depends on eye-hand coordination, um, the development of skill sets uh, as well as knowledge. Um, and so you get this kind of what we call body learning or body knowledge that, that has to do with repetitive motions uh, and the ways that the body learns to do certain kinds of activities. So these early ancestors, these Australopithecines, Homo habilis, even Homo erectus, they might not have looked much like us. Um, they almost certainly didn't speak. They probably didn't have a fully developed language, um, although they almost certainly had some means of communication in order to pass on the knowledge that, that, that had been accumulated. It could be just a matter of watching and re replicating processes and that sort of thing. But th there are some levels of communication that begin to, to develop prior to what we recognize as a full-blown language. They may not have you know, really looked like us, but they're starting the processes that lead to modern humans. Um, uh, and these processes are not only evolutionary processes that work through speciation, but processes of technological development as well. In producing stone tools, there are two broad classes of components. The first is the core, which is what this old one chopper is. The core is the piece that has pieces knocked off of it. Those pieces that are knocked off are called flakes. And they have a more knife-like form often. As you can see, they tend to be a little bit thinner. The edges tend to be more acute uh, and sharper. Um, and so they're suited for different kinds of processes, different kinds of uses. 
where cores have the mass of the stone behind them, and so they, they, they're, they're good for bashing and chopping. Flakes have that sharper edge, and so they're good for slicing and cutting. Um, they can be manipulated and used for scraping and, and, and other kinds of activities. In the Lower Paleolithic, the main focus, sort of definitionally, is on the cores. Um, and first with the Oldowan choppers, as we've seen, and then with what we call the Ashulean hand axe. And the Ashulean hand axe is a very different looking sort of thing compared to the Oldowan chopper. It's symmetrical across multiple axes. It's thinner. It's flaked bifacially on both sides uh, and all the way around the piece in order to produce the symmetry. The Achillean technology goes back a, a little over a million and a half years, and it continues in use for over a million years. The species that is primarily associated with Achillean is Homo erectus. Now, they are recognized as close enough kin to be assigned to the same genus as us, um, but they are still fairly different creatures. If you were to run into a Homo erectus person uh, on the subway, uh, to use the, the classic form, you, you would not recognize them as a person, probably. Um, but they're spending a lot more time upright, as the naming suggests. Uh, they're doing more work with their hands even than the predecessor species Homo habilis, that's named for use of the hands. Um, they have the controlled use of fire. Um, they have a number of different kinds of technologies that, that are available to them. And they've spread to many more parts of the world uh, as well. In addition to the functional technological uses that the Ashulean hand axe has compared to the Oldowan chopper, there's another thing that it has that is not so much about immediate function and technology. And that is what I would argue is an aesthetic quality. The tool does not need to be beautifully symmetrical and nicely made in order to do what an Achillean hand axe did. In fact, some Achillean hand axes are fairly crude, unesthetic kinds of objects. But I'm focusing on this one because it's so very nicely uh, symmetrical. There are examples that are even nicer than this, though. For example, there are examples that are made on striated stone that have stripes running across. There are even a couple of examples known that were flaked out in order to present a fossil in the middle of one face. There's no need to do that, but it looks really cool. Um, and I think that our ancestors, by the later Lower Paleolithic, by the Achillean, by the time they are the species we recognize as Homo erectus, that they are beginning to have this kind of appreciation of aesthetic qualities. Um, this is pushing it back way further than a lot of people are comfortable doing, but I think that it's worth going out on this limb in order to make the argument. We often think about early human ancestors as very alien to us. We think about creatures, especially that we classify as different species, as being so different that, that we couldn't understand them, as, as lacking many common attributes. Um, and so I like to explore the possibility that, in fact, there were more similarities than are commonly recognized, and more abilities than were commonly recognized. So I won't insist on recognition of aesthetic qualities in the Ashulean, in the Lower Paleolithic, but I want to suggest them. I want to make you think about them, um, and I really think that they're there. And I think that most people who handle a lot of Paleolithic stone tools also might recognize this, um, although many, I think, would be reluctant to actually talk about it. The next shift in technological classification is so great that it is marked by a change in the classification of the period. So we jump from the lower Paleolithic to the middle Paleolithic. And that shift is where the lower Paleolithic focused on the cores, the middle Paleolithic focuses on the flakes in terms of tool production. Middle Paleolithic cores are much less regular 
Now, this might look casually more or less like a hand axe. It's got a similar kind of shape, but you can see that it's not as symmetrical. It's much more roughly made. Um, it has pieces that have been knocked off of it uh, in order to get the piece off and work with that rather than in order to produce this as a functional piece. And those flakes would then be reworked much like this one. This is the ventral surface of the flake, the part of the flake that was towards the core when it was struck. Um, and this is the dorsal surface, the part that was on the outside of the core when the flake was struck off. Um, and it's had a number of other smaller flakes removed all along this edge in order to produce this sort of curved, crescent-shaped scraping edge. You can see it's fairly steep in cross-section. Um, it's not a fine, acute, pointy, knife-like edge. Um, and that's typical of most of the Middle Paleolithic stone tools. They are dominated by scrapers, things that would have been used with this kind of motion rather than with a slicing kind of motion. When we say scraper today, the image that mostly comes to mind for people seems to be a hide scraper, using a tool to scrape the, 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 the fat and flesh off of the inside of a, of a, a skinned out animal. Um, but in fact, these stone scrapers, the edges are a little bit jaggedy um, because they've had, they're made by having flakes knocked off of them and that leaves little high spots and little low spots. And if you scraped this along a soft, fresh piece of hide, it would score grooves into the leather that would weaken it. Um, and so it's counter, kind of counterproductive. Um, and there's been some edge wear analysis done on some scrapers from, from this period as well. And what they seem to have been used for predominantly is scraping what you might call semi-hard materials wood, bone, antler, ivory, um, materials that are harder than flesh, um, soft plant materials, but not as hard as stone. And they were using these stone tools in order to produce tools out of those semi-hard materials in which you could scrape a much smoother edge, for example, that would be useful for scraping along a hide and not leaving scored grooves behind. Um, you can make uh, bone antler points, harpoon points with barbs uh, coming off the side. The examples of these that we have here in the collections are mainly casts uh, of, of originals rather than being the originals, but we do excavate from some cave sites uh, original worked bone pieces from this period. Um, and that's one of the ways that we can talk about how they were done too. We find a lot more worked bone in the Middle Paleolithic. Um, and in the Upper Paleolithic that comes to follow. Now this is an interesting step because it's not just picking up a material and making a tool out of it. It's picking up a material and making a tool that you can then apply to a very different material in order to make a tool that couldn't be made on the first material. Where Middle Paleolithic flint napping worked with cores to produce flakes that were sort of any kind of shape that were then retouched, flaked further into scraper shapes. The classic Upper Paleolithic technology is what's called a blade technology that is based on carefully preparing the core to a particular shape in order that you can then strike it and with that single blow, drive off a flake with a particular form. Now, this is a very large example of an Upper Paleolithic blade core, uh, the blade being that particular form. And you can see it has a series of what look like flutes along it. Each of those is the removal scar of one flake. And those flakes were elongated, narrow blades like this, uh, technically defined as being at least twice as long as they are wide, although as with this one, they often are considerably longer than that. And those blades, just like the flakes of the Middle Paleolithic, could then be made into tools by further flaking, by retouch along the edge, producing scraper edge, like on the end of this blade, or on the opposite end of this one. By flaking along the edge, you can produce a chisel form, 
Um, and the chisel form becomes much more common in the Upper Paleolithic um, and is particularly useful in working things like bone and antler, where you can score a line uh, using that sharp chisely edge and then snap it in order to produce clean breaks. And by doing that, you can make the kind of elongated splits that can be then worked with barbs to make barbed points, or you can even cut little grooves into the edge and set little tiny stone bladelets into the edge uh, to produce a sort of a jagged stone-edged bone or antler-backed point. In the Middle Paleolithic, and then especially developed further in the Upper Paleolithic and beyond, we also see more things that appear to be the points of weapons, uh, spears uh, probably uh, of one sort or another. And this probably goes hand in hand with increasing reliance on hunting as opposed to scavenging for protein sources. Uh, compared to the Lower Paleolithic. If we look at the whole Lower, Middle to Upper Paleolithic sequence, um, we, we probably have a kind of a general transition from scavenging towards hunting. Um, that's not to say that no Lower Paleolithic person given the opportunity uh, would have killed an animal or that no Upper Paleolithic person would have scavenged uh, something if they found, because you, you, you would. It's also not to say that there are not plant resources that are being used, um, probably throughout this entire period. The Upper Paleolithic is a period of the development of high art, including representational art of animal species. Now, there's a lot of debate about Paleolithic art, um, um, the classic cave paintings being the stereotypical example, uh, and their depictions of animals. Was it hunting magic? Was it um, staking claims of abilities? Was it related to storytelling? Was it related to clan kinds of uh, associations? Um, and we really don't know, but we think that, that in all likelihood, some aspect, some amount of pretty much all of those kinds of things may have been associated with the use of representational art depicting animals um, by these, these hunting and gathering peoples. In terms of specifically food technologies, they are able to cook. Um, they could cook over open fires. They may have been able to boil using skin bags or using internal organs as soft containers. Um, these can't be put over a fire, but they can be heated in, in other kinds of ways, using stone boiling, for example, uh, where you heat up rocks and then drop the hot rock into the container with, with liquids. In terms of hunting technologies, we know that in the Upper Paleolithic, they did have the use of the spear thrower, the atlatl. There are examples that have been recovered from Upper Paleolithic archeological sites. And the atlatl, the spear thrower, as the name suggests, is a technology associated with projectile weapons, with a spear that is thrown, uh, that leaves the hand as opposed to a thrusting spear that you hold in your hand and you just kind of jab. Both can be effective hunting technologies, but they have different uses, uh, different primary purposes and applications. Now, I'm going to skip over the Mesolithic. Um, in some parts of the world, there really is a Mesolithic that's distinct from the Upper Paleolithic and the Neolithic. Um, but in many parts of the world, I think that the Mesolithic is really a transitional kind of thing that is the Upper Paleolithic plus some later kinds of things or the Neolithic minus a few things or with the addition of some earlier kinds of, of technologies. Um, uh, plus, here in the collections, we don't have very many Mesolithic pieces, um, and so it's much more convenient, I think, um, but also somewhat logical to jump from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic.
The Neolithic and the Bronze and Iron Ages that follow represent a tiny fraction of this longer vision of human history. It's the part of this human history that's easiest for us to recognize. They are people who anatomically look like us. They spoke languages uh, as we do. They lived in houses. They did a lot of the same kinds of things that people do today. They're basically us um, with, with relatively subtle distinctions compared to most of the people who went before. But relative to all of those people who went before, the Neolithic people did develop a lot of new things. They domesticated both plant and animal species uh, in, in different places. They developed the technology to produce and use ceramic vessels. They became increasingly sedentary, um, moving over restricted parts of land um, uh, and focusing more intensively on uh, the, those particular local environments. And then over time also trading with others who were settled in other areas um, so that rather than moving from place to place in order to get access to different resources, you would stay in your place and trade with people who were in other places. And we see these reflected in the material culture um, and in other remains. Domesticated animals we see th primarily through changes in the bone structure of those animals. Um, but we can also make some inferences out of the numbers of animals and the ways and choices of animals that are being processed, uh, being turned into food. The working with domesticated plant species leads to the production of certain kinds of tools that are associated with those, um, perhaps most classically sickles for harvesting grain, which we see in the Neolithic in a variety of forms. We also see a consequence in this in the increasing frequency of axes um, that appear to be actual hafted axes like you would use for chopping wood, which would be associated with removing trees, both for fuel and building materials, but also in order to clear land for horticultural and agricultural production. Here in the anthropology collections, we are fortunate to have a nice collection of Danish Neolithic stone tools. These were actually acquired by A.D. White himself, Cornell's first president. Um, he recognized when Cornell was being founded in the 1860s, early 1870s, the significance of the new archaeological interpretations that were coming out of Scandinavia. And when some of these materials turned up in the market and were available to be purchased in educational institutions, even though Cornell is a new institution, archaeology isn't primarily a university-based discipline, he recognized the importance of this material, especially in terms of understanding the later classical periods that were more widely taught in university settings. Um, and so he acquired those for Cornell, uh, and we have them in the collection still today. So you will see here stone axes, large axes for uh, felling trees, but also smaller axes and even some concave ground gouges for hollowing out pieces of wood. We have sickles uh, associated with the production of grain, and you can see the classic sickle polish uh, along the edge of this example in particular. There are other woodworking tools like chisels uh, and picks. But one of the really interesting things about the Danish Neolithic in particular is that while they don't yet have the use of bronze, they were sometimes in contact with people who did have access to bronze tools. And so one of the things that the Neolithic Danes did was to copy the forms of bronze tools in flint. And so we see flint axes that are shaped very much like bronze axes. We see triangular flint points, very unusual to produce a triangular flaked stone form, but it is mimicking the cast triangular bronze arrow points.
we see even daggers in flaked stone uh, in the Danish Neolithic that are mimicking bronze daggers. Some of these that have been recovered uh, in Scandinavia are incredibly fine examples. We don't have any uh, super fine uh, examples here in the collections, but some, some perfectly recognizable daggers uh, in, in flaked stone. They sometimes selected in these materials a yellow flint that was available in the area, which would come close to the color of bronze. Uh, although bronze, when we see it today, archaeological bronze, we're used to seeing it in sort of brown and green colors. When it's new, it's literally gold in, in color, um, very bright and, and, and shiny. And so these yellow flints uh, would approximate that kind of color. They also not only produced these flaked forms, but they would then grind and polish them to a smooth surface, as shiny as possible, using other stones for grinding. And by doing this, get to something that as closely as possible approximated the surface of bronze metal while working with stone technologies. They also produced a variety of ceramic vessels, which could have been used both for cooking and storage. One of the important needs in becoming increasingly sedentary, in relying on domesticated plants in particular, which have seasonality to their availability, um, is the ability to store food materials uh, in order to use them uh, at, a, at a later time than when they come available. Containers are so important um, and so widespread in the Neolithic that some have even referred to the Neolithic as a container revolution. Um, uh, in addition to ceramic vessels, one of the domesticated plant species in some parts of the world is the container gourd. Um, most of us today, when we think of gourds and squashes, we think of the edible forms, pumpkins, uh, zucchini, all of these sorts of things. But some of the earliest domesticated forms are the ones that develop very hard rinds uh, and can be used as containers. Certainly by the Neolithic, and probably earlier, we also find the use of basketry as containers taking plant materials and, if necessary, splitting them into thin bits and then weaving them together in order to make containers. Baskets can also be made watertight using a couple of different techniques. You can either weave the basket so tightly that water can't get out of it, or you can take a basket and coat it in an impermeable substance um, so that it is watertight. Most of us today live in settings where we have enough different kinds of watertight containers that we don't think about baskets as potential liquid carrying containers. But if you don't have ceramic vessels, metal pots and so forth, then it can be a very useful alternative. In some areas, containers were also made from stone, uh, particularly in areas where relatively soft stone, easy to carve, uh, is available. And so, for example, here in North America, there are traditions of carving bowls out of soapstone. Uh, of course, in ancient Egypt, they developed this to great heights using, in particular, alabaster uh, and other soft stones to carve typically smaller uh, stone jars and bottles and such. Ancient Egypt, among other places, also developed a couple of food technologies that remain important and interesting to many people today, based around the actions of yeast on sugars. One of these is fermentation to produce alcoholic beverages. And the Egyptians had ceramic vessels that were specifically used for putting liquids into with sugars, typically coming from fruits, uh, but also augmented with grains and, and other kinds of seasoning materials um, that would be allowed to then have the yeast act on it and ferment into a probably fairly low alcohol level beverage. They also used yeast to produce breads, leavened breads. Um, and one of the ceramic vessels we have in the collections is an unusual 
to most of us today, way of making bread. This large, heavy ceramic jar would have been heated uh, in a fire uh, in a commercial bakery along with many other examples of such. And then the prepared dough would be placed into the jar and then either a flat ceramic piece or stone or another jar of the same shape placed over the top of this. And the jar is so thick and heavy that the residual heat contained from, from preheating it would cause the bread to, to rise and fill the interior of the vessel and, and then bake. And we know this from written records, but also thanks to the excellent preservation that we get in some contexts in, in Egypt, there are even some loaves of bread that have been recovered archeologically. Another class of tools that's very useful for working with grains and other materials is the mortar and pestle, which comes in many different forms. Um, including this classic Mexican form, the mano and metate, that is used for grinding corn, um, and also forms that may be more familiar to many people, uh, the bowl-shaped mortar with a rod-shaped pestle, uh, in this case one from California, where they were used for grinding nuts into meal which could then be used as a flour. It could be further processed to extract the oil. Uh, there were a lot of uses that were made of, of nuts in places where they're widely available. And of course, once people have access to metals, to the ability to work in metals, the variety of forms that can be produced, the variety of different uses and styles uh, just, just explodes. And we get an incredible variety of different sorts of things as can be evidenced by walking into any department store today and, and looking in the cookware section. So throughout the long extended human history, going back millions of years, material culture has played a wide variety of very important roles in food production, in serving, in distributing, in all kinds of processing of food-related materials. What we have seen here in this video is just a small sample of, of the wide range of materials that are out there related to food production in material culture.